Welcome to the third and final segment of the introductory lectures on evolutionary theory. Here are summary slides for this portion of the lecture. I want to remind you that these are available in PDF form in Canvas, and I provide a link to them in the weekly to-do list. Let's begin by exploring the most basic definition of evolution, which is written on this slide. Evolution, at its core, is change through time over generations within a species. You yourself will not evolve. You will develop. Natural selection and evolution are not the same thing. Natural selection is one cause of evolution, but it isn't the only one. This portion of the lecture will focus on the origins of the theory of evolution by natural selection and the cast of characters responsible for coming up with it. What is natural selection? Here is a very wordy definition that we will later summarize in less than 10 words. For now, here's the full and complete definition. Natural selection is a process in nature in which organisms possessing certain genotypic characteristics that make them better adjusted to an environment tend to survive, reproduce, increase in number or frequency, and therefore are able to transmit and perpetuate their essential genotypic qualities to succeeding generations. If you're wondering what genotypic qualities are, we will go over a definition of genotype in a future presentation. Earlier in this series of lectures, I mentioned that evolution is a theory. Here is what I mean more specifically. A theory is a comprehensive explanation of some aspect of nature that is supported by a vast body of evidence. The theory of evolution is supported by so many observations and confirming experiments that scientists are certain that the basic components of the theory will not be overturned by new evidence. Evolution is not a law of science. A scientific law we are all familiar with is the law of gravity. Biology doesn't have laws because nature is much more messy than matter or energy. However, just as you are aware that what comes up must go down, you will learn that it is impossible to avoid evolution by natural selection. With regard to the validity of Darwin's ideas and the larger body of theory on evolutionary change that they inspired, we like to say that the data is in the strata. Strata are layers of earth, and numerous excavations of fossils carried out over hundreds of years confirm the big ideas in evolutionary theory. Before we talk about Darwin and his ideas, I'd like to introduce you to some of the lesser known scholars who likely inspired Darwin's work. Whereas many great scientific discoveries are attributed to just one person, they are most often the result of many minds coming together, even if they never did so physically. Geologists played a big role in shaping Darwin's understanding of the age of Earth and major changes in Earth's environments, such as the formation of the Andes Mountains, which caused some species to go extinct and others to emerge. Recall the fossils that Darwin found in the documentary you watched. While examining seashell fossils in a rock quarry in Paris, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck observed that species weren't fixed and that over time they appeared to modify. He was one of the first people to talk about adaptations to environments. Later, we will learn what is specifically meant by adaptation. Giambattista Bracchi was an Italian geologist who observed geological formations like these mountains in Italy, whose gradual eruption revealed distinct layers of time once buried underground. Bracchi surmised that one lineage can give birth to another, and that lineages were like individuals. A lineage of organisms might appear in one layer of Earth, then die out and be replaced by something similar in a more recent layer or stratum. Was Darwin the first scholar to write about a theory of evolution by natural selection? Check out this writing from an Arab writer and theologist from the medieval era. Animals engage in a struggle for existence, for resources to avoid being eaten and to breed. Environmental factors influence organisms to develop new characteristics to ensure survival, 
thus transforming into new species. Animals that survive to breed can pass on their successful characteristics to offspring. This sounds an awful lot like a theory of evolution by natural selection to me. The author of those words, Uthman al-Jahiz, was a medieval African Arab naturalist who wrote on topics including Arabic grammar, zoology, and poetry. He lived nearly 1,000 years before Darwin, and while it is unlikely that Darwin read his work, Al-Jahiz's writings are the reason why many people say that the origins of evolutionary theory lie in the Islamic Golden Age, a period of cultural, economic, and scientific flourishing in the history of Islam. Alfred Russell Wallace was a contemporary of Charles Darwin. According to historian of science David Quammen, while most people associated natural selection with Charles Darwin, another Victorian naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, came up with the same idea after years of living in the Far East, studying and collecting animal and plant specimens about 20 years before Darwin. Wallace was also an outsider, lacking Darwin's wealthy background, class status, and family legacy, which is one of the main reasons why Darwin rose to stardom and Wallace did not. Despite this inequality, Wallace never seemed angry that Darwin received all the credit. David Quammen writes that Darwin and Wallace were friendly towards each other, though not close. Wallace respected Darwin and didn't seem to feel bitter about the fact that we now talk about Darwinian evolutionary theory rather than Wallacean. You've learned a great deal about Charles Darwin from the documentary you watched. Here are some of the main aspects of his career as a theorist that I would like you to know. This slide summarizes many of his main contributions, including the idea of adaptive radiation, which he could have nicely proved with the Galapagos finches he collected had he remembered to label them by island. Adaptive radiation, in this case, could have explained the slight differences between the finches that were produced by living in different environments on different islands. While they were all descended from a lineage of finches that somehow reached the Galapagos from mainland South America, they diverged as they adapted to their different islands. On the Origin of Species is Darwin's most famous book, and arguably one of the most influential books of all time. When it was published, it sold out immediately, and by the end of his life, his theory of evolution was generally accepted. This book lays out his most important theoretical conclusions, including the idea that all life shares common ancestry, that species change over time through adaptation, or what he called transmutation, and he relied heavily on specimens and observations collected while traveling aboard the Beagle. Perhaps the most classic example of natural selection observed long after Darwin's death is that of the peppered moth, a type of moth with natural variation in its population whereby most moths are white with black flecks and some moths are dark gray or black. This is similar to the black squirrels you may have seen on campus. They are what is called a dark or melanistic morph or different variety of the same species. I'm guessing you know the story of the peppered moth, but what I'll share with you might include some details that you hadn't previously been told by your high school science teacher. In the 1850s, most of the peppered moths living in forests near cities in both Europe and North America were peppered. By the end of the 19th century, there were very few of the peppered variant within the population, and they had been replaced by a boom in the population of dark morphs. This change had to do with environmental pollution, namely the soot spewing out of coal burning factories during the Industrial Revolution. As a result, even the bark of trees was covered in soot and appeared to be black, which enabled the dark morphs to have protection from predators. It's hard to imagine what those times were like, but here's an image of London in the middle of the day, so clouded with smog that it was nearly impossible for people to see and breathe outdoors. Events like this, led to the passage of Clean Air Acts regulating pollution and the corporations that produced it. On this graph, our y-axis shows the percentage of dark moths in the peppered moth population. On the x-axis is time. 
over time, the percentage of dark moths in the population radically declined due to environmental laws that forced corporations to take more measures to protect air quality and ban the unfiltered spewing of air pollution from factories. Each circle represents another regulation introduced by legislators, including the Clean Air Act and the rise of the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. As lawmakers clamped down on industry, the air became cleaner and so did the formerly soot-covered trees that had become safe havens for the dark or melanic peppered moth morphs. There is no way to avoid evolution by natural selection. In order to illustrate this, I'll need your help participating in a little experiment. Let's pretend like the population of raccoons in Cupertino has two distinct forms, much like the peppered moths dark and peppered morphs. In this case, one group of raccoons, which we will call population A, is afraid of trash cans and therefore will not visit them to find food. Population B, on the other hand, loves trash cans and as a result, consumes far more calories when foraging each night. Let's say that we're going to monitor a population of 200 raccoons. 100 of these individuals are type A and the remaining 100 are type B. Raccoons from population A don't have access to many sources of food. They consume fewer calories and therefore aren't able to have many offspring. Raccoons from population B eat more food, have higher fertility, and live longer. This means that they have more babies before dying. Each member of population B has two offspring over the course of their life. Raccoons from population A only have one baby before dying. Think of these numbers as one or two babies per individual raccoon, not raccoon couples. After one generation, population A has 100 members, whereas population B has doubled and now has 200 members. After two generations, population A has 100 individuals, meaning that each raccoon essentially replaces itself before dying, and population B has doubled again. After three generations, population A, the trash can fears, has 100 individuals, while population B is now at 800 individuals. After four generations, the trash can fears make up less than 6% of the total raccoon population, while the trash can loving bee squirrels, uh, excuse me, bee raccoons make up 94% of the total population. Natural selection is hard to avoid, but in order for it to occur, three things must be in place. For a trait to be acted upon by natural selection, it must be heritable. In other words, it must be linked to our DNA or controlled by a gene. My daughter has inherited my blue eye color, for example. She will not inherit a crooked toe that I broke while playing soccer on the beach. A trait must also cause an organism to survive or reproduce more or less successfully than others. Over time, natural selection will lead to the disappearance of harmful traits as observed in our fake example of raccoons, or pave the way for the spread of a particularly beneficial trait. Lastly, if no underlying variation exists in a population, selective pressures won't change the percentage of different traits in a population because there are not percentages to shift up or down. Underlying genetic variation is key. If heritability, differential mortality and reproduction, and variation are all in place, then evolution by natural selection can occur. Evolution has two fundamental processes. The first is change within a lineage. On this human family tree, the trunk represents a lineage or line of organisms with shared ancestry. That began about seven to 10 million years ago. As we trace the trunk up from its roots, we see the genus Homo at the top. Over time, a variety of species emerged within this genus. Recall the Neanderthal and Denisova people we talked about earlier? 
They are related to humans through a common ancestor, Homo heidelbergensis, we think, who died out as humans and Neanderthals emerged. The variety of members of the genus Homo that popped up from a common ancestor over time illustrate change within a lineage. The second fundamental process is the formation of new lineages. At about 4.5 million years ago, we see that the genus Paranthropus arose as a distinct group of ancient hominins, or extinct bipedal apes, sharing common ancestry with Homo sapiens. This represents the formation of a new lineage that occurred in the ancient past. As I mentioned, the genus Paranthropus is now extinct and disappeared about 1.5 million years ago. Evolutionary theory has two key principles. The first is that much of evolutionary change comes from natural selection, although not all of it. And the second is that all species share common ancestry. This is apparent in our cells. All life on Earth shares the same genetic material, or DNA. While it is comprised of different genes, different numbers of chromosomes, and different sequences of base pairs, the basic structure is the same. We're now going to review three falsifiable predictions generated from the theory of evolution. If the discovery of contradictory evidence proved these predictions to be false, the theory of evolution would be overturned. We're going to run through these predictions and examine relevant evidence that has been discovered to date. The first prediction is that if all life on Earth originated long ago, then evolved, earliest life forms should be simple and later forms should be more complex. We can test this prediction by looking at the fossil record. Fossils found in the deepest strata or layers of earth are those of bacteria and later simple multicellular organisms. The fossil record confirms prediction one. If life originated on earth once, earliest forms of life should be simple. The brilliant and eccentric scientist J.B.S. Haldane, an evolutionary theorist, mathematician, and self-experimenter who blew out his own eardrums to study the effects of pressure on sailors in submarines, noted that finding rabbit fossils that could be dated back to the Precambrian era would refute the idea of common ancestry. So far, no 700 million year old rabbits have been discovered. The second prediction is that the fossil record should show gradually changing species and evidence of lineages splitting over time to form new lineages. If we look at the evolution of the modern horse, we see precisely such sequences in the fossil record. Hyracotherium, or the dawn horse, was a small dog-sized animal with three padded hoof toes on its front feet, similar to dogs. Over time, the single-toed hoof of the modern horse was gradually selected for, as seen in the fossil record in which bones of the forelimb or front leg are shown to fuse and recede in the transitional fossil species, linking the modern horse to Hyracotherium. Can you think of any splits in the modern horse family? Zebras, wild donkeys, and horses are all examples of splits in the modern horse lineage. They are all members of the genus Equus. The third and final prediction is that transitional fossils should be found connecting modern life on Earth with extinct life forms that gave rise to them. Here we have a quintessential transitional species found in the early 2000s in China that links bird and reptile lineages and more specifically shows common ancestry between birds and dinosaurs. Cynorhythrosaurus was one of the first dinosaurs discovered with feathers. It lived during the early Cretaceous, 130 to 125 million years ago. Its name is derived from the Greek Chinese bird lizard and is pronounced Cynonithosaurus. Modern birds descended from a group of two-legged dinosaurs known as theropods, whose members include Tyrannosaurus rex and smaller Velociraptors. 
A velociraptor, for example, had a skull like a coyote's and a brain roughly the size of a pigeon's. According to paleontologist Stephen Brassat, a bird didn't just evolve from a T-Rex overnight, but rather the classic features of birds evolved one by one, first bipedal locomotion, then feathers, then a wishbone, then more complex feathers that look like quill pen feathers, then wings. The end result is a relatively seamless transition between dinosaurs and birds. As it turns out, crocodiles are the closest living relatives of the birds, sharing a common ancestor that lived around 240 million years ago and also gave rise to the dinosaurs. Crocodilians are actually more closely related to birds and dinosaurs than they are to other reptiles, for example, lizards, snakes, and turtles, as a recent genetic analysis done by scientists at UC Santa Cruz confirms. In 2007, young Earth creationist Kirk Cameron asserted that the absence of a crocoduck proves that the theory of evolution is false. You may recognize Kirk Cameron from the shows Growing Pains and Full House. Here he is in a photo with the cast of the 1980s sitcom Growing Pains. Can you think of some arguments to refute his assertion? Here's a short YouTube video that debunks the crocoduck argument. Welcome to Three Minute Debunks, where we debunk asinine assertions within three minutes. And on this occasion, the star of the minutes is the breathtakingly stupid Kirk Cameron. On May 5th, 2007, in a debate aired on Nightline, Cameron presented his now infamous crocodile in the attempt to mock and denounce evolution, and it backfired tremendously. Science has never found a genuine transitional form that is one kind of animal crossing over into another kind, either living or in the fossil record. And there's supposed to be billions of them. Now, what I'm about to show you does not exist. This is what evolutionists have been searching for for hundreds of years. All right, and if you find one of these, you could become rich and famous. So here's some transitional forms. This is called the crocodile. Can you see this? Crocodile and a duck. Oh boy, where to start? How about with Brian Sapien's immediate and hilarious response? Can you see this? To get straight to it, the crocoduck is a grave misapprehension of what a transitional form is, and it spectacularly exposes Cameron's abysmal ignorance of the subject. Or worse still, it exposes him as a contrived and deceitful liar. A transitional form is not a random combination of two organisms. That's a chimera. Rather, it's an organism that has characteristics of both its ancestors and descendants. To illustrate this, Consider the following two examples. A species of amniota is considered to be the most recent ancestor between snakes and humans, but it would be incorrect to call it a transitional form between the two, because one didn't transition from the other. They are related, but they are not closely related, just as crocodiles and ducks are related, but they are not closely related. On the other hand, Tetrapodophis is considered to be the most recent ancestor between snakes and lizards, and it would be correct to call it a transitional form between the two, because one did transition from the other. To the untrained eye, it might look like an elongated lizard, but unlike lizards, and just like snakes, it has a short tail, broad belly scales, a skull with a short snout and long brain cakes, curved jaws and sharp hooked teeth. It is, if you will, the snizzard. Moving on, and to get to the crux of this rebuttal, 
Due to Cameron insisting that the crocoduck is exactly what evolutionists have been searching for for hundreds of years. He is misrepresenting evolution in order to make it easier to attack, which is pretty much exactly the definition of the straw man fallacy. It's the equivalent of me asserting that Cameron believes that there is an omnipotent, bearded Caucasian man within the clouds, and that if you find him, you could become rich and famous. Just as Cameron would dismiss this nonsense because it doesn't accurately represent his position, so can the scientifically literate dismiss his crocodilic crap. And that's it, folks. Game over. The crocoduck is a straw man fallacy, and Kirk Cameron is Kirk Cameron. So, why aren't there any crocoducks? The crocoduck does not exist, nor has it ever existed, because the common ancestor for the duck and the crocodile lived long, long before the modern-day crocodile and duck evolved. Their ancestors took off along distinct evolutionary branches long before crocodiles and ducks came into being. Therefore, it would be impossible to find a transitional fossil crocoduck or a living crocoduck. The crocoduck would in fact be considered a hybrid and not a missing link. The common ancestor between birds and reptiles looked much more like a dinosaur than either of these living organisms. So here we have our final slide that gives you an overview of some of the key players who you need to be able to recognize in a quiz. What are their contributions? What did they do? And here we have another final summary slide with the key concepts that hopefully you can now explain and understand. So remember that these all of these slides are available as uh, PDFs in our course Canvas page.